All right, once again, welcome aboard the RMS Queen Mary. RMS stands for a couple things it could stand for. Royal Mail Ship, Service, or uh, Steamship. Uh, so it depends on what book you're reading, which kind of what era they're talking about. The most important part of that is mail, M-A-I-L. The Queen Mary was not only the luxury ocean liner of her time, she also had a contract with the British government, and that was to haul the mail. That's one, and why we are so obsessed about timely mail service when like 80% of it wants something from us uh, is beyond me. But uh, the, uh, uh, that was one reason why she was not the uh, most comfortable ride, because she had a schedule she had to keep, so she'd go straight through everything, weather-wise. So, gonna give you a little bit of a timeline, and we're gonna go for a nice walk. 1926, planning began for the construction of, not yet named, Queen Mary. The blueprint stage went from 1926 until 1930. It was in 1930, December, when construction began at the John Brown Shipyard in Clydebank, Scotland. Now her name at that point was simply Job 534, not Queen Mary, that comes later. Job 534 has a stack of blueprints uh, that's like insane. It, it's crazy. I've seen portions and pieces and parts of it. It's, it's amazing. There was no computers allowed. You know, they didn't even exist. So it was all done the old fashioned way. It's just nuts. So uh, the, the construction began in 1930. After only about one year, Cunard, her owner, the Cunard line, ran out of money. The Great Depression had hit and it had hit hard. It hit everybody hard. So Kennard basically ran out of uh, their liquidity, was depleted. So they had to shut down uh, construction. For about a year, Kennard executives were doing all kinds of talking to the British Parliament politicians, trying to do uh, what we call today, the common term is a government bailout. They needed help. Otherwise, they were going to be dissolved. They were going to disappear. So. Cunard is doing all this negotiating with the British Parliament. Finally, the politicians gave in and said, all right, we will fund your construction of Job 534, but there are strings attached to this agreement. You must merge with another company called the White Star Line. Now, White Star was her chief rival, uh, and uh, White Star may be somewhat familiar to you, all right? They had a little incident about uh, uh, back there in 1912 with that much smaller ship that had a really incomplete career uh, that they built the Titanic. And so that was Canards, however, that was their chief rival. They were forced to merge. For about the next decade, if you're a history buff and you look at uh, read a lot and all that, you'll see where some of that literature will say Canard White Star Line. It'll be combined uh, for about a decade or so and then White Star ended up in see ya. So, Construction resumes again in 1932. In 1934, we have the launch of Job 534, and she is christened Queen Mary by Queen Mary herself. And it's at that point, the, basically just the whole of the ship, just the outer shell, is slid right into the River Clyde. From there is when we get all of this construction. The engines were added, the boilers were added, all the big stuff was added, including the infrastructure like what's right here. Uh, it took only about two years to do that, which had to have been just an absolute rampant pace of construction to get all of this done in such a short period of time. I, I, I can't hardly even imagine just the, the daily worksheets and things as to what, how many people would have been on board. I've heard as many as 3,000 at a time. Uh, would have been crawling around here doing all their little tasks. But somebody had to manage all that. So, May 27th of 1936, the completed Queen Mary uh, uh, takes off for, on her maiden voyage, leaving Southampton, England, arriving four and a half days later in New York City on June 1st of 1936. Uh, there is actually a great picture of her arrival in New York City. It's in a weird place on board. It's clear up there at the forward stairwell and go down a couple decks and you'll, you'll find it down there, way up at the forward stairwell. I don't know why it's there, but it's a great picture if you get a chance. So for the next three years, the Queen Mary was literally the queen of the North Atlantic, dominating 
the transatlantic market. Everybody who was anybody was on board, wanted to be on board. However, on September 2nd of 1939, World War II broke out. Germany invaded Poland. With the invasion of Poland and the Queen Mary at that time, exact moment was at sea on her way from Southampton to New York City. That last crossing there would be the last civilian work that she would do for almost eight years. For the next eight years, she was a troop transport ship where she carried over 800,000 American troops. She also carried troops from Great Britain, Australia, uh, New Zealand, and Canada. Uh, she was a very busy. She averaged about 15,000 men per crossing. Now that's hard to imagine, but I, uh, the way it's described is when they would load everybody on board with their equipment, the Queen Mary would actually sit four feet lower in the water. That's a lot of people. All right, uh, that's that's heavy. So uh, let's see, hospital ship, prisoners of war. At the very conclusion of the war, she had still had more work to do. She was bringing troops home, but she was also bringing women and their children to the United States. The women had married American soldiers during the war. They were provided transportation. Little stipulation there, they had to be met in New York City by their husband to basically be claimed on the docks. Otherwise, they were turned around and sent back. So can you imagine missing that appointment uh, for the guys here? That, that's not cool. That's a date you don't want to miss. Uh, so uh, now we get back in 1947. She was put back together uh, in her pre, the original ideas, the original dream of having, having this luxury ocean liner. And for the next 20 years, that's exactly what she was. Now, from 1947 to about 1960, domination. Her and her sister ship, the Queen Elizabeth, absolutely controlled and dominated the North Atlantic. No other, no other company could even come close. However, there was a new industry about 1960 that begins to emerge. Airplanes. Airplanes were faster, they were less expensive, and time is money in business. So like big businessmen and things like that, this just, the market simply went away. It wasn't that the Queen Mary did anything wrong, it was that the, a new industry actually just simply surpassed. So, early in 1967, we have the Queen Mary put up for public auction by Canard Line themselves. Put her up for public auctions, put her up for sale. Of all places, the city of Long Beach had the highest bid. Now, we could stay here all hour and I could tell you about the politics behind all of that that was going on. But uh, she ended up with the highest bid, the last bid submitted from Long Beach. So if that tells you anything about the timing issue, uh, $3,450,000. That's a lot of money, right? We could take the railings off of the ship today and pay for her. Just these railings right here, like all over the ship, not just this one. But we could take just a part of her and actually uh, get the return. So that's the value that was purchased, even though there wasn't the value as a ship at sea anymore. Then, 1967, after a 39-year journey, she, uh, she arrived in Long Beach. She left Southampton, England, had to go all the way down around the tip of, uh, of South America, Cape Horn, and then all the way back up. During that tip, around the tip, windows of her promenade deck where we just walked by and where you were just standing, there were windows broken by the waves. That's how rough the, the ride was, that last one. So not fun to be one of those final passengers on board. She arrived on December 9th of 1967 right here in Long Beach. Think about your calendar that we all have here. Coming up this December 9th marks her 50th anniversary in Long Beach. 50 years. It's kind of hard to imagine. And I don't know what we have planned, but I'm assuming it is a roaring party of some kind. I don't know what, but uh, you're all invited. So uh, yeah, come on down. Now, it uh, took about three years to convert her into the hotel that we have. We have uh, nearly 350 hotel rooms today. We have the historical destination, like what you were enjoying today. We also have meeting places, various rooms of all shapes and sizes for just about any kind of venue you could possibly think of. Uh, we have a place for it on board. 
We even have one, it's not open right now, but we have a big exhibit hall that's, it's, they're doing a bunch of work on it. I think it's 35,000 square feet. Big, uh, it's like for a big, you know, convention style sort of thing. Uh, they're doing a bunch of work on it, it'll be open whenever, I never ask dates anymore. But uh, that kind of a thing, there's a lot going on. You may have noticed it as you were climbing over some of the barriers and trying to figure out how to park and all that fun stuff. There's a lot going on here. Uh, she's just very busy, but we're very, we're, we get frustrated too. Uh, but we're very happy at the same time. It's been a little while since she's had some tender, tender love and care. So, does anybody have any questions? Yes, sir. I guess on a final voyage, she was too big to go through the Panama Canal. Correct. She's 118 feet from beam to beam. Panama Canal in 1967 was 110 feet. She was eight feet too wide. Now today, they've, they've redone the Panama Canal. It's, I think it's 180 feet or something. It's, they've really widened it. Uh, so she would today, but, but uh, yeah, back then she had to go all the way around. And it took, another reason, it took 39 days. They were only going on two screws, two propellers. Uh, they were trying to save money on fuel. It cost, towards the end of her career, $75,000 a day just in fuel. Uh, the price of her fuel originally was almost nothing. She burned what was called Bunker C fuel oil. Really low grade, pretty nasty stuff. Uh, and nobody wanted it, so they got it really, really, really cheap. Well, she burned 1,100 tons of Bunker C fuel oil per day, usually 24 hours when she was out at sea. So she really went through it. She held over 8,000 uh, tons on board. It was cheap at first, so it was great. But as time went on, other ships were taking on the Bunker C fuel oil. They were converting to that as their fuel source and all of that. Price went up. So towards the end, it was like horribly expensive for her to just keep going. Keep going. What else we got? Yes, sir. You mentioned she could transport 15,000 troops at yes. a time. What was the normal capacity? Normal capacity uh, would have been 2,000 passengers, 1,200 crew. Uh, in about, probably, I don't know, a quarter of those, nobody would have ever seen the, the, uh, the crew. They would have been engine and down below. They're, they're those guys down there. Nobody ever saw them. Uh, you basically had a two to one ratio. Two passengers, one crew member. That's where her motto for Canard, first class unsurpassed service. That's it. Very simple motto. Uh, if you were willing to pay for it, you got it. And we're going to talk about prices in a little bit. But, uh, Four and a half days. Now she was very fast. And I'm going to talk about that right over there. In fact, let's let's go. We have a quiet main hall right now. Let's go over here. Beautiful woods. On board, we have 56 different types of wood from all over the world. Now, 56 seems like kind of an oddball number. You know, it just doesn't. It should be an even number or something. But there is a reason behind it. If you think real good, uh, think well. 1936, the British Empire had how many colonies around the world? 56, okay? Uh, and I always call them colonial interests. Some places were firmly in control, uh, and others they had a little bitty flag poked in it, and they claimed it. Uh, so just varying degrees of, of influence. But they had 56 colonial interests around the world in 1936. They took woods from all of them. Uh, to implement into the construction. That's pretty intense. Uh, that took a lot of uh, planning and a lot of money to spend on gathering your resources. So, I'll tell you just a little bit about the main hall. This was first class passengers only. And there's a couple things that have changed. I'll try to tell you about a couple things that have changed. In 1947, they replaced the original paneling on those back walls back there that two-tone beige leather. Now, I don't know who chose leather, but in 1947, apparently that was the way to go. Uh, that was the hip thing to do. It used to be chestnut and ash. It's beautiful. The pictures of it are just gorgeous. I don't know why they changed it. I, I don't know the reasoning or anything like that, but I think they were trying to modernize a little, trying to make it more appealing and all that. The other change in here is the floor. What we have here is a lino basically a linoleum. This was put in here in 1947. 1947, uh, right after World War II. Originally, on every corner of the ship, what we had what was called corkoid. Corkoid was a cork and rubber mix, 
and it was uh, uh, not soft and squishy like the track gym or something you would think it kind of would be. It was actually very firm, very hard, but it did not absorb water, and it also was easy to clean. Now, there's a couple reasons. Like I said, waves could hit these promenade deck windows when they were out in the North Atlantic. Now, not every day. But they could happen as far as 80 feet above the water line. It did happen. So they did, all ships take on water. So it was, it, but they had to be aware of that everywhere on board. The other is, and you'll notice if you look, those that are on this side of this pillar right here, look down here. There's this little inset thing about waist level. That thing. Uh, that's where they could tie ropes to it to connect it to all the pillars to create a webbing in here because it was so rough. You would have these guys in their fancy suits and the ladies in their beautiful gowns and they actually had to hang on to a rope so they didn't go fall, sliding across the deck. Along with that, they were sick a lot. So the flooring like corkoid was actually, you know, clean up on aisle five was very, very uh, common. So over here on the port side, we have, uh, uh, originally, this was a cigar and candy store. Uh, you got your nice big stinky cigar and a little bit of candy to cover it up. Uh, the woods in there are mahogany from Honduras. There's also an African cherry. Beautiful wood. Excuse me, over on this side. Uh, today we have the Wyndham Welcome Center. Uh, originally, this was the W.H. Smith & Sons bookstore. Back in the early 1830s, W.H. Smith & Sons started the trend of anywhere there is a traffic spot, like railroads, uh, ships, any place there's traffic. Today it would be airports. You put the most modern literature uh, that you can find, like the top 20 bestsellers and all that. Go to any airport, you'll see it uh, in any airport. They started that in it was the 1830s. Uh, today, obviously, it's this. Uh, notice the carpentry. These sliding doors here. The sliding doors, you're not going to find at Home Depot. All right, very good. This period of construction is really pretty neat. Uh, it's simple. It, there's very few right angles. There's lots of curves and all that, but it's so just hands-on crafted. It's really, really neat stuff. All right, right this way a little ways. Over here on the port side, first class library. Now this is different than the bookstore. The library had the classics. It also had the, uh, the daily newspaper on board. There was a printing press on board and they would deliver a kind of a summarizing news uh, headlines, bulletins uh, for all the passengers in first class or anybody else who wanted to pay for it. Uh, and the printing press was basically straight down from us as far down in the ship as you can get. So that would be theoretically the smoothest part. They wouldn't have all the numbers or the letters and things it was the old school printing press. To, uh, today it's a shop. This also served as the Anglican Church on Sundays. So yeah, and I'll talk more about that in a moment. Over here, we have the first class drawing room. Basically a lounge. Uh, it's just a sitting room, things like that. Uh, this also served Winston Churchill as his headquarters during World War II when he was at sea. He considered the Queen Mary his at sea headquarters. That was his office. Now the finalized plans for the D-Day invasion were signed in that room. Winston Churchill and General Eisenhower finalized and put it into motion right in there, right in front of the uh, fireplaces where the ceremonial pictures were taken. Uh, this also served as the Catholic Church on Sundays. Now, yeah, Anglican, Catholic. Now, this was first class territory, unless if you were a second, and that would be uh, cabin class, or you were a third class or tourist class. We always say second and third because that's easier, but it was actually cabin and tourist class. If you wanted to attend a church service and you were from one of those other classes of passengers, you could come up here and attend the service of your choice. Just imagine how many people found religion on a Sunday <laughs> if they were at sea on a Sunday. They could come up and see how, you know, see how first class was suffering up here. Now, Right out here in the middle, this was the Austin Reed clo Men's Clothing Store. This whole little area right here. A couple of the woods in here from India. India Indian silver gray and Indian laurel wood. The laurel's the trim. Uh, today it's another one of our shops. 
but up above is one of our finer examples of the Art Deco style of, of art on board. We do have one of the largest collections in the world uh, in place of Art Deco, that 19, late 20s, 30s. Uh, that is a freeze. It's called Sport and Speed by Maurice Lambert. Now, it looks like ivory. It is not, I promise. Uh, the, it is actually plaster. It's been very finely uh, carved and everything, and then they pressure waxed it. So it gives it that look of ivory. Now it's called Sport and Speed, which I like to kind of call, it's a perfect hood ornament for the Queen Mary, because she was all about power and speed. She was not only the largest and uh, most powerful ship ever built, she was also the fastest. For 14 of her 25 years of civilian work, she was fast and she proved it many, many, many times. So that's uh, 50 feet in length. Goes all the way around the corner, all the way around this side. So pretty, pretty good. All right, follow me. Construction in the port was uh, uh, Clydebank, Scotland is where she was built. Her, her home port was Southampton. Uh, the Cunard offices was in Liverpool. Yeah. All right, we're moving forward up here just towards the bow. I'd like you to look into the, through these windows, uh, get you a chance to peek through these windows. This was the first class children's nursery. Everything that you see in there is original to the Queen Mary, dating from most of it way back. All of the items in here go uh, came from the first, second, or third class nurseries that were around the ship. They just combined them here for, uh, for our purposes. A couple things here. 41 bunks were placed in here during World War II for officers. This was officer country up here, and they put 41 men in there. It had been nice and tight. Uh, you can about imagine what it was like for the enlisted men back in the ship. They, they packed them in. They actually took every door off of every cabin and stateroom and suite because the doors took up too much room. So it tells you how they were concerned with space. Another thing about this room is that the parents could drop off their children here for a, fu a full-time professional nanny, would have them under their care, so the parents could go to their playground. <laughs> right behind me is one of the, I think, one of the neatest rooms on board. It is the observation bar. And we're going to walk through. No to-go no to cups allowed. But, well, actually you can if you want. Uh, but. Uh, we're going to walk through. We're not going to be stopping much, but let me tell you a couple things about what's in there. It has been the scene for a whole handful of movies, movie scenes, uh, like being John Malkovich, uh, The Aviator, Pearl Harbor. There's, there's been a, quite a few, uh, that, a, a bunch actually, that have, they've did various scenes in there. Another thing is that everything in there is authentic and original, except for the floor. It's carpeted. There was no carpeting anywhere on board, so kind of eliminate that from your thinking and put that, uh, that corkoid in there, and everything else is original. The, the light fixtures were taken out during World War II. At the conclusion of World War II, they were brought back. No changes made. The artwork above the bar is done by a man by the name of Thomason. He was a, a, a it's a, kind of a neat little story. It's a big, well, you'll see it in a second. It's all about music. It's about George V's 25th year as king. It's a big celebration, a big jubilee. The artist wanted to be, Thomason wanted to join the military during World War I. They denied him because he was deaf. They took him on as a, as a uh, military artist. Almost all of his work involves music, which is kind of interesting. I don't know exactly how that worked, but he, that he did it. So it's really neat. Another thing, there's two woods in here I want to point out. One, and you can kind of see it from there, it's below the railing. It's called cedar maw. Uh, cedar maw is a mutant wood. It is cedar and mahogany. Now, I don't know how this works, but once every 150 years, yeah, I lost most of you at this point. <laughs> once every 150 years, a type of cedar and a type of mahogany, figure out how to form a union. I don't know how that works. And that's the product right there. Their little offspring is cedar moth. Uh, for natural production of cedar moth, it's only once every 150. Uh, that is a neat wood to look at. It's very, obviously very rare. The other is about at my nose level. Right when we walk into the door, and it'll be over by the exit when we go out, look right about this level, and it's a little trim piece that's laid into the paneling. It's English elm, which is extinct today. 
and it's one of the classier little woods that we have on board. It's got a really neat grain. So let's walk through. No eye contact to the bartender. They're good. <laughs> Isn't that a neat one right there? Huh. Really unique. years old right here. It's, it's teakwood from Burma. Uh, it is uh, 81 years old. It's Now it's been protected, so it's going to last a little longer. We have the teakwood up one deck outside. It's exposed. We're, we are replacing that as needed and as, as we can. It's really expensive. Uh, but this wood is chosen by many. It's very popular on watercraft of all shapes and sizes. One reason is it's, it's not fireproof, but it does burn really slow. Uh, it's real dense wood. The uh, uh, one other little neat fact about this: before her maiden voyage, 1936, but early on, they were on board, and this was one continuous loop. The promenade deck was one quarter mile in length, and it went all the way around. We've done some remodeling since then, but it was one continuous. On board during some of their test trials and their parties and things was a uh, British Olympic runner. His last name was Burley. He was preparing for the Berlin Olympics. He was challenged to run the promenade deck and see if he could break the one minute quarter. He did it in a tuxedo. The shoes even. So, all right, here we go. All right, a few more statistics. I've shared some of them, but we'll try to get to I want you to know as much about her, like structurally and whatnot. She was the first ship ever built over a thousand feet in length, 1,019 and a half. She was 118 feet wide, 185 feet in height from the top of her stacks to the bottom of the hull. She weighed just shy of 82,000 gross tons. Her horsepower, her engine room, could produce 160,000 horsepower. Almost four times the horsepower of that other little one, the Titanic. So different generations, I'm not knocking the little guy, but uh, she was power and speed. I always like to think of it as it would be like Shaquille O'Neal as your speedy point guard handling the point. It just doesn't make a whole lot of sense. You know, it does, it's kind of hard to, to visualize it exactly what she was, however. Now, we already answered the question, uh, there were 2,000 passengers, typically, 2,000 passengers, 1,200 crew. It was not like the movies, where they put all the first class passengers up high, and they're up there just strolling along, and everybody's happy. Second class down below, where they want to be first class, and then down in the bottom, those poor third classers, you know, sitting on hay bales, feeding the livestock, and you know, all that. That was not the Queen Mary. First class, always called first class, was in the central about third of the ship. Basically forward stack to rear stack, roughly. Uh, from top to bottom. That was the smoothest ride. Second class, they were, that was known as cabin class. They're back here towards the stern. Ride was probably fairly similar, but you're right on top of the engine. So you had kind of a whole other yeah, th bunch of things you had to deal with, like vibration and heat, uh, things like that, that would just make it a little more uncomfortable. Third class, also known, they called it tourist class. They were up there about where we started. They were up there towards the bow. That was the roughest ride. Now the bow of the ship would fluctuate on a good North Atlantic day 30 to 40 feet. Vertical movement. So you're on a constant elevator ride. That wasn't this fast, but it was, you know, those swells are out there. She would be moving in a, several different directions at the same time. The Queen Mary is one fifth of a mile long. About a fifth of a mile. So she's feeling every kind of direction you can think of. Now, also, during 
in storms. They would bolt steel hatches over the outside of the windows of the, prom, uh, the observation bar on this deck. They would put them on the outside to protect the inside because the waves would actually come up and over the forward bow and hit that promenade deck level. That's about 80 feet above the waterline. So you're seeing 90 to 100 feet. I have seen the picture and I thought we had one on board. I, I chased it around for years. Thinking we had one, you know, like one of these big pictures on board. It was during World War II and she was diving down. It was a picture taken from another ship. She was diving down into the bottom of the swell and the water was crashing right up against like this level here, up over the front and her rear two, she's got four propellers, or had, four propellers, two forward, two, two towards the rear. Those two towards the rear were out of the water. And she had about 15,000 men on board. Can you imagine being that poor farm kid from Iowa, stuck down in the middle of this thing and you're doing that? I mean, that had to just been an absolute terrifying experience. You know, 18, 19 year old kid, all of a sudden you're in the middle of this thing. That'd be absolutely mind boggling. Now, what else I got right here? I think we need to get out of the heat. All right, let's go. We're going to go down a set of stairs. Yes, sir. Uh, uh, I'm crossing during World War II. How many escort ships? No escort ships while, when she was up to speed. She outran everything. Oh, okay. It's, it's a very, this is a great point. She was the, one of the fastest ships in the world. Okay. 28 and a half knots was her cruising speed during the war. I'm assuming they, you know, pressed that up five mm -hmm. knots easy. A German U-boat went half her speed on the surface. A torpedo only went about 24 knots in the water. She could even outrun a torpedo. She was never fired on, at least that we know of, she was never fired on in anger. She had depth guns uh, for, it would have been more for the aerial defense. When she would be getting up to speed, which would take anywhere from six to 10 hours, depending on conditions, took a long time. Get her up to speed, she would have escort ships then, which would be leaving for it. And when she would be arriving, I mean, she didn't just come hopping in like a jet ski, right? Uh, it took all day for her to slow down safely. And that's when escort ships would come out from the coast to provide, you know, protection from the few boats. Okay. There was a reward out for her that Adolf Hitler put on her for $250,000 and the Iron Cross to any U-boat captain in the same. Winston Churchill said she shortened the war, her, the, the Queen Mary and the Queen Elizabeth they did about the same type of duties all throughout the war. He, Winston Churchill claims, he, he proclaimed that she shortened the war, they shortened the war by two years. She was that, that large of an impact. We saw all the men who just kept getting poured into Europe uh, uh, for just those reinforcements. You know, it just kept coming. There was no end, basically. How long did she stay in port to refuel? And it would take her probably one full day. They would have been ready. Uh, yeah, there was only one time she was delayed, and that was 19 days when she had a collision with one of her escort ships and had an 11 foot dent in her bow. And, and they limped that. I don't know how this works this part either, but they filled the bow up with concrete, basically concrete band aid on her front bow. She was taken on water when she struck. Uh, but they patched her up and got her back to Boston, where they put her not into dry dock, but kind of a semi dry dock so they could expose the bow. And 19 days later, she was back at it. Very fast. I mean, something like that today would take a year and a half. Yeah. Be forever. All right, let's get out of here. It's hot. All right, we are going to go down this hallway right here a fair amount. I want you to take note of a couple of things. Number one, watch your head, tall guys. All right. Uh, but other, another thing, notice the railings that are along the sides. Those railings were not there originally. Uh, originally, the designers did not believe that she would need them. She's too big. Railings are ugly. So they didn't have any railings in the passenger sections, which would be like down there, uh, until their fourth, it was like their third or fourth crossing. They had to be met on the dock in Southampton, England, after uh, a, they needed 100 ambulances because so many people were hurt. They went through a storm, had to keep their schedule, and just beat people up, uh, passengers and crew. Some of them, you know, broken bones and everything else. So immediately, they went out and they found the hot ticket item of that day. It's called Bakelite, 
Bakelite. You'll hear it. Ah, okay. Uh, it, people who had a Bakelite phone, you were something. You know, you were on, your household was on fire if you had a little Bakelite around the place. It's like having that latest, greatest kitchen countertop. You know, the one that won't scratch, stain, or any of that. And then a year later, there's the next best, next, you know, all that. Really expensive. They went out and bought 20 miles of this Bakelite. It's, a, it's PVC pipe today. That's basically what it is. Uh, it's an early form of plastic. That's all. People loved it. They were just, ooh, just like you were about the phone and everything. Just, ooh. That's how, uh, th that's the funny part of, of the Queen Mary. I mean, she's extravagant and incredible, but pretty simple at the same time. You know, there's a certain simplicity to her at the same time. Now, notice the railings. Also, I want you to notice the floor. Now, if you, so those that can see down that hallway, you may notice a little bit of a curvature there. There's a, it's like we're going to be walking downhill a little bit. Mm -hmm. you've, if you've been on the other tour, you've already heard the term, sheer to deck. Huh? Nobody? Oh, good. Cool. I tell it better anyways. But uh, anyway, sheer to deck is an engineering tactic. Uh, that other ship that did this and then went put and you know didn't do so well. Uh, it, it had straight deck engineering. Everything was right angles. No uh, no wiggle, no flexibility, no nothing. Everything was right angles. The Queen Mary go went back actually to more ancient type engineering tactics, kind of like the Viking ships. You know that banana shape. That's what she's employing here. Gives her flexibility, durability, twistability, all the abilities you need out there if you get caught in a storm in the middle of the North Atlantic. Now the crazy thing is, you could stand here when they were at sea, you could stand here, look down the hallway, and you could see her twisting just ever so slightly. You could see her twisting and torquing and flexing. Now that would be unsettling enough, but can you imagine if we had the audio? I would love to, underneath, all of this beautiful wood, which is all over the place, is almost 82,000 gross tons of steel. She was making noise. And I would love to have an audio recording out in the middle of the North Atlantic in 1936 during a healthy storm, because she would have been just singing. Now her last captain, her last captain, there's a quote from her last captain. I love this guy. He's the one who brought her to Long Beach. His name was Captain John Treasure Jones. What a name. Right? That's enough said right there. John Treasure Jones. He said, and he has several quotes. He's, he's very witty, very succinct. He's really cool. He said, she was as near a living being as anything I ever commanded. That's cool. I mean, that is real. That says it all right there. I can visualize him, or really kind of anybody for that matter, walking down an alleyway, as they called it, the hallway, walking down there and finding it just really easy to talk to her because she felt like she was alive. You know, just that energy that would have been going on all the time. So cool. All right, we're going into the hotel, so no screaming. Uh, we're going into the hotel's portion. We're going to go down here a little ways, and then I have a little surprise for you. Okay, so follow me. Oh, come on. If you were finding it a little difficult to breathe, you've been in second class. We'll get back on the good side here. There we go. What you're looking at now is what actually the inside of one of the cabins looks like. You were a first class passenger. You were spending in 1936 for two tickets round trip $1,070. Now that today's money that's about $18,000. So if you had to ask what a ticket cost you probably weren't you know in the market. I always compare it to people who own those those big long speed boats the what they call them cigarette boats or whatever they're like from here to way over there if you're spending three million on a, one of those, you don't care what a gallon of ga gas costs. Right. 
So they just do it. They don't care. That's kind of how many of the passengers would have been here. It was not an issue. Uh, so that's one. Second class passengers or cabin class, they were still, it was still really expensive. Today's money, about $12,000. Third class or tourist class was spending about six thousand dollars. Not using rounded numbers, but it gives you an idea. About six thousand dollars today. That's a lot of money. Now, one thousand seventy in 1936, the average household income was seventeen hundred dollars a year. So you know, it was a big deal if you were going to be on board. There were those. We have stories of people that this was their bucket list item of their lives. They saved money, pinched pennies all their lives so they could afford a first class ticket. And there are those kind of stories, but most of the time, it was the wealthy, it was the famous. We have, uh, there was actually, there's dog kennels up on the top, top deck, uh, the, the sports deck. People traveled more with their animals, their dogs, than they did with their kids. These are the wealthiest of wealthy. Their kids were at boarding school back in those days. Yeah, you wouldn't even be around. <laughs> They weren't even around, and they would travel with their animals. Elizabeth Taylor, right? Elizabeth Taylor refused to book a uh, ticket until she spoke personally with the pet chef. Until she spoke personally with the pet chef to see what was going to be fed to her poochie. Uh, she would not pay for a ticket for herself. That's the kind of people that you had on board. Now the stewards on board, they prided themselves on that first class unsurpassed service. They prided themselves on learning all the passengers by name. Nobody was walking around with a ticket or anything like that. They knew that you were in cabin, you know, wherever, and that was your area of the ship, and you had a steward or probably a couple of them, they would have tag teamed, and they were taking care of you for four and a half days, anything you needed. That's the kind of service that you had. So pretty, a uh, pretty special, special spot. Yes, sir. Was it all exclusive? Yes. Now, except there, well, there would have been extras. Uh, one is if you go outside on the rear of the ship up to the veranda grill. Uh, if you see that today, it's used for parties and receptions and things. Uh, that was the first class private dining hall. They not only had the grand uh dining hall or we call it the grand it was the first class dining hall which is way down deep it's massive and beautiful they had also their private dining area that's where a lot of the celebrities actually went it was five dollars extra had to be paid when booking your crossing uh five bucks was you know a fair amount of money back then um but that was mostly like actors and actresses that just didn't they wanted to stay away from pretty much everybody they were trying to stay off the off the radar they would eat way back up in there Yep. And then at late at night, it turned into kind of the first class private party lounge. It's crazy up there. So, anything else? Yes, ma'am. Um, how was it to hire the staff? Were they always the best? Absolutely. Yes. Uh, they prided themselves on that first class service. The, like, it, a lot of times it ran in the family, even. Uh, it would be family members that, you know, they would have to almost sponsor a new hire. So it wouldn't necessarily have to be like a blood relative, but it would be if somebody's going to come on board, I would, they would want somebody to know them who's already on board. And if they didn't work out, I might be held accountable too. If I'm just recommending my buddy for buddy's sake, I could be in trouble too because everybody wanted the job. These guys lived off their tips. They made, they made more money than the stewards. Many of them made more money than the ship's officers. You know, they, they were pros. Uh, Today, for instance, up in Sir Winston's restaurant, uh, it's five star. It's been there for almost 40 years now. It's wonderful. I don't know what the exact number is, but everybody who works there has been there for, I think the average is like 22 years or something. Been there a long time. And that's one of the things they really uh, uh, are proud of. They promote is the service. They're, it's that professional service, uh, the way it's supposed to be, the way it used to be. Not today where it's like, you know, what y'all want, you know, okay, whatever, you know, it's, it's real pros. So, what else we got? I can stand here all day. I love this. Yes. notice he had, like, kosher dishes in the... Yes. This was the first ship ever that had a Jewish synagogue, uh, a permanent synagogue. Not even a, the Anglican and Catholics had to wait until Sunday. There was a Jewish synagogue. It's, uh, where are we? Down a deck, I think, and all the way towards the bow. It's not there anymore. 
it's a storeroom, I think, today. Uh, but that it was the first ship that actually had a Jewish synagogue on, on board, and they had their own kitchen. They would cook the food that, 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 they, that they requested. Absolutely. She was very innovative in a lot of ways. Uh, very innovative in a lot of ways. You could call anywhere in the world on a telephone from this ship if you were willing to pay uh, something like $72 a minute. It was like the early, uh, they had the power that they could transmit a phone message. Uh, and it was, it's kind of funny. I, I remember when they put the phones on the airplanes for the first time, it had the little cord, you had to pull it out and you know, swipe the card and all that. And it was like, yeah, I'm on an airplane, love you, bye. You know, and it was like $6. Uh, you know, it was the most expensive phone call ever. Well, they, I'm sure they did a lot of that sort of thing too. Because uh, it was really expensive, really expensive. What else we got? Hotel occupancy. Always filled? Weekends for sure. Yeah, I'd say weekends 99% of the time. We're pretty well booked up. Uh, it gets quiet during the week sometimes. Uh, not that often. Uh, it, she's, we're, it's very busy. Uh, I don't have the numbers uh, in my head, like the percentage. Uh, you I don't have I, to wait months and months to, to, to reserve a room. No, I had family come in uh, last week, and I think they booked out maybe a month. So, and there's people that just drive up. They don't have a reservation. If it's during the week, yeah, you'd be all right. You may not be able to pick and choose too much as far as what room you want or something. But, uh, but yeah, during the week, unless we have things going on. Now, be careful. Like, Dark Harbor's getting ready to start here at the end of September. Uh, good luck. You know, I, it, it, we're pretty well covered up there for the next six weeks or whatever it is. Oh, I'm assuming. Or yes, we go up and down with the tide, just like any other vessel in the water. Uh, she's not sitting in a cradle. She's not sitting on pylons or anything like that. Uh, if you can recall what the what the, the gangway, what angle you were walking on when you came on board, notice when you leave. If, if I mean, it may not be a vivid memory in your mind, but try to note what it was like when you came on and what it'll be. When I leave at night, I, I always laugh because I like come out of the very stern of the ship and it's like I'm like going straight down almost off the ship it's crazy uh, but and it's noticeable it's really really noticeable so but yeah the stacks look like they're like angled on there. they are okay, for aerodynamics I mean in its simplest of forms all right one of the things that all watercraft all vessels any vehicle if I guess for that matter is just taking away the sharp edges and that provided just that little bit of aerodynamics um, because a ship or any, anything in the water has what's called slip. Uh, and it's where your propeller, the propulsion, is not matching your actual distance covered. There's a loss there. Friction, basically, just generally speaking, it's friction, water and air. And it, having those stacks straight up would be just, you might as well throw a sail out. It'd be just like an anchor. So you curve them back just a little bit. It looks really cool. And, uh, and it does serve, you know, at least a minute purpose of a little bit of aerodynamics. Remember, she was going about low 30s miles an hour. She was flying. And if you, I mean, it's the Gerald R. Ford, the new aircraft carrier that was just commissioned, their stated cruising speed, 28 and a half knots. You can't get much higher than that because nobody would be able to stand on the deck. I mean, it, it, then it gets beyond a danger factor. Now, the, J, the Gerald R. Ford, I'm sure, can really go. That's nuclear whatever, okay? I mean, it could probably go 50 knots if they really wanted to. But to be safe and functional, 28 and a half knots. Same as this. 1936, we were doing it. So ahead of our time, just a tad. Absolutely. How fast is a normal cruise ship? These little guys over here off the stern... 20 maybe you know and that and, and those are different they have they look a little bit bigger most of those that park right over here are actually a little bit smaller those are in the 60 thousands the tons because they, they have such a shallow draft they can go into just about any port uh, without too much trouble that was one of the things there was con uh, contemplation about turning the Queen Mary into a cruise ship you know bounce around in the Caribbean or whatever well one is People were burning up in here. You get down into the tropics, it was terrible. Uh, but the other is, she's too deep. She goes like 44 feet underwater. And so she required a deep, deep ports. That's why when she would go from Southampton, she would stop over in Cherbourg. And most of the large ships did this, but they stop at Cherbourg, France, and then take off. That's where they pick up passengers and mail. They had to be met. Uh, they couldn't go into the port. They had to come out, sit tight, and then they would ferry people out and ferry the mail out or whatever packaging they may have. So, 
but yeah, she was kind of restricted to the job of a, a luxury ocean liner. Ladies and gentlemen, I have to cut you loose. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you for letting me lead you around.